Hey guys, what's up? Uh, just really quick, uh, you may have noticed I'm actually in basically the same t-shirt because I'm making this video really shortly after my previous one because it occurred to me that even though I think the cold cycle is really, really useful, I didn't exactly give you guys a lot of concrete examples of what each of the stages look like, so I'd like to break that down right now real quick. For those of you who don't know what the cold learning cycle is, really simply it's a four stage cycle or process uh, by which you can learn things a lot more smoothly. I highly suggest you check out the video before it goes into a little more detail about it. But anyway, the first stage again was concrete experience. So what does that look like for the language learner? Well, concrete experience can be anything from asking somebody where the bus stop is in a foreign country, to talking to a teacher if you're going to a language class, to meeting somebody at a party and trying to hold a conversation, to writing a journal or even ta just taking notes. The stage after that was reflective observation. So this could be anything from thinking back to a conversation you had with a native speaker where maybe they didn't understand something, to coming up to your teacher after class and asking about a mistake you made or a certain point you didn't get, to listening to yourself on the IC recorder if you practice speaking, to watching native speakers on a, like a TV show or movie. Hey guys, so I'm dressed totally differently here because uh, for some reason the audio on this segment of the, the video I made just stopped working. So here I go. So the conceptualization part of the process could be anything from reading a book on the grammar or looking over some mistakes and wondering what was wrong with them or why they are mistakes, uh, to thinking about a particular phrase or expression that you might use and why you would use it in certain ways, uh, to looking for patterns when like you're reading a book. Finally, the experimentation stage, which is a little more actionable, and this is where we're coming up with a goal. Like if we made a certain mistake before, maybe our goal is to correct this mistake or practice it quite a bit. It can also be when we go out and seek native speakers, whether they be teachers or just some buddies, and maybe ask them to help us come up with some ideas for what we can do next to get better at the language. Okay, so now let's take a look at a full-on example. Let's say you found yourself a private teacher, or maybe what's called a language exchange buddy, somebody who's helping you out in the language you're trying to learn. And let's say it's Japanese, because, well, like I said, that's what I study. So obviously your first step is going to be meeting this person. That's the experience stage right there, right? So this might be your first time actually meeting a native speaker and trying to use the language, and you're probably feeling pretty nervous. But you should give yourself a pat on the back because this is the most important stage of all, experiencing the language. And in all likelihood, it probably went pretty well. I mean, obviously you probably made a few mistakes, but you probably actually communicated more than you thought you could, and the other person probably understood you pretty well. So, on to the next stage we go. Well, if you're pretty lucky, your teacher or your partner is pretty good, and they gave you some helpful feedback, and maybe some tips and some ideas for what to do next. And if you're super lucky, they actually told you more specifically what you did wrong and how to correct it, which would be awesome. Now you've got some material, some observations with, to work with. But anyway, even if your partner or teacher wasn't that great, you can still kind of prod them a bit and ask them some why questions. Or you could try looking some stuff up on yourself. The internet's a big wide world and there's plenty of answers out there. So after we've completed that reflection part, we're on to the abstraction part. Okay, let's get even a little more specific. Um, in Japanese, there are these two words that I used to confuse all the time, and they're kawaii and kawaii. And you really don't want to confuse these two words because they're quite different. Kawaii means cute, kawaii means scary. So yeah, imagine trying to tell your girlfriend she's kawaii. Okay, so the next thing up is a plan of attack. We're not gonna make this mistake again, so let's come up with a strategy for how to fix it. So maybe the strategy is you're going to come up with a bunch of sentences using kawaii, properly of course, and then a bunch that use kawaii. And you're going to make sure to practice them and use them next time you meet your partner or teacher. You may even go a step further and look around for other words that Japanese learners often confuse. And I also didn't wrap up my video, so let me go ahead and do that now. 
Uh, sorry, this is this video is really out of sorts. Anyway, thanks so much for checking this out. And as usual, I will have something up on Sunday, maybe related to this topic, it may be related to something else. But please do check it out. As usual, if this video was helpful to you, please give it a like. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please subscribe. I do upload every Sunday at least. If there's anything specific you'd like me to talk about or any questions you have, please feel free to leave a comment below or send me a direct message. Till next time, take care.